Hi, I decided to produce this video because I'm making a new projector, a new laser projector, centered around a powerful yellow 575 nanometer dye laser. The dye laser is in turn pumped by a converted LS800 series double Q-switched 532 YAG. The YAG laser, the, five, the 800 series, and for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, is very bright, it's very powerful, but it tends to produce a rather compromised beam. It's large in diameter and has a relatively high divergence. But in their attempt to produce the highest conversion from the 1064 fundamental to the 532 output uh, wavelength, the designers had incorporated a Q-switch option which produces a rapid train of very high peak power pulses, which enhances the conversion from the 1064 to the 532. It also increases the average output of the output of the laser from about four to five times, but it increases the peak power 300 times more than that. So as a result, it makes it an excellent source for pumping a dye laser, which requires a very high peak power. The laser, the LS, has been significantly modified, as has the die head, to enhance its output power as well as uh, reduce its divergence and allow it to operate at a uh, 575 nanometer wavelength. As a consequence, the die laser has a very high conversion efficiency. It converts about 45% of the 532 nanometer light to the 575 nanometer light, and that's very good. In addition, the divergence of the beam coming out of this dye laser in a 2 by 3 millimeter collimated beam is about 0.5 milliradian, which also is very good. The modifications, however, haven't changed the overall layout of the laser, which is fairly straightforward. The dye solution is stored in a reservoir, about one liter of it and it's drawn out of the reservoir by a pump that you really can't see very well here because it's under all of this hardware. The pump pumps the dye at a relatively high pressure, about 40 PSI, to this dye cell, which consists of two quartz windows separated by a small metal spacer. And then the dye returns through a radiator to take some of the heat away that has been built up by the pumping process through a particle filter and back to the reservoir to complete the loop. The dye is pumped under relatively high pressure because it needs to move through the cell at a fairly high velocity. I'm not sure exactly what the speed is, but it's on the order of meters per second. The reason being that a dye laser, uh, specifically the xanthine dyes, when pumped by a stimulating source, generates both an upper laser state as well as a parasitic triplet state. The the problem is that the upper laser state has a lifetime on the order of a nanosecond, and the triplet state, which absorbs laser light and inhibits laser action, has a lifetime on the order of milliseconds. So if the dye were to remain static and continually be pumped, what would happen is the triplet state would continue to accumulate and eventually it would quench the laser output. So by moving the dye so quickly past the focused spot on the cell, new ground state dye is present each time as, uh, one of the brief pulses passes through the laser. As a consequence, even though there still is a small amount of triplet state that is uh, created at the same time as the upper laser state, there isn't very much of it, and it doesn't have that significant an effect on decreasing the output of the laser. In human terms, the milliseconds is still very fast, and so I'm pretty confident that the triplet state has probably already relaxed to the ground state by thermodynamic means before it's even gotten out of the cell. But nevertheless, it has plenty of time as it makes the route through the system and back to the cell again to, be, to um, continue the pumping process. The layout of the pump laser is pretty straightforward. The output beam exits the laser, passes through some correction optics, is folded up onto the upper plate, where it is focused, folded again, and then brought to a spot within the cavity of the laser. Okay, enough talk. I think what we'll do now is I'm gonna actually operate the laser so you can see them in operation. And so I'm gonna turn on the pump, the liquid pump for the dye laser. You'll hear the pump 
sound in the background. Now I'm going to let this run for a little while just so that any air bubbles that may have formed from dissolved gases in the system have a chance to be flushed out of the cell. I'm also going to go over here and I'm going to turn on the KTP laser. So we'll go ahead and you'll hear the pump of that laser in the background. Same thing, I'm going to let the system circulate for a few seconds. That'll make sure that there's no bubbles along the lamp or the rod that could diffract the light. And then after that's been on for a little bit, and I'll go ahead and I'll turn on the KTP laser in the continuous wave mode. Right now, there's 20 amps flowing to the uh, KTP in a continuous wave, and you can see if you photograph up here, very bright, the laser is in continuous wave, so despite the fact that it's as bright as it is, four or five watts is impinging on the cell, there's no laser output here. I'm going to go ahead and switch on the Q switch and that'll increase the peak energies about a thousand times, and then you'll start to see the output of the uh, dilates. And you can see it's quite bright, and if the camera picks this up, you'll see between the two resonator mirrors a very thin air-like line of the laser operating between the high, res uh, the, uh, high reflector and the partial reflector here. The light coming out this side through the lens and impinging on the uh, power meter. Right now you can see that the power meter is reading about five and a half watts. I'm going to go ahead and dial the laser up to about 50% input power. These lamp-driven lasers, the KTP, are not linear in their output. They tend to peak. But from previous experience, I know that when I dial this thing to about 25 amps, I'm at about 50% power. And so right now, the output of the laser is running at about half power. And after a few minutes, as the dye solution heats up in the system, uh, the viscosity of the dye drops, and the pump is a little bit more effective. The velocity through the cell goes up a little bit, and I gain about five additional percent. And this uh, output meter will read almost exactly 10 watts. What I'm going to do now, after you've seen the output power, is I'm going to turn down the Q-switch, or turn it off, so that I can take the power meter out of the circuit. This is going to let me put an attenuator in here. The reason being is that in order to see the quality of the beam out of here, it's so bright that you really can't look at it or measure it against any kind of a graph paper. It just it washes out the camera and it's physically or visibly impossible for you to see with your eyes. Now, I'm gonna position this mirror. It's about a 99% reflective mirror. It sends most of the energy down to this black anodized plate, but a small amount of the light comes through the mirror. I've got a piece of graph paper that has two and a half millimeter squares on it. And if I hold it in the beam, you can see that small spot. I'll try not to shake my hand too much. If you can visualize that, you'll see that the spot is just a little bit bigger than one grid square. I measure it when I look at it carefully at about two and a half by three millimeters. If you then look across the room, you'll see me pointing to the spot on the small mirror over here. All the way on the other end of the room, I want to bring the camera over here so you get a good view. I set up a grid to show that at about 11 meters, it's about three or four squares high and about two, two and a half squares wide. So you can do the calculations yourself in terms of divergence, but that is, uh, to my calculation, about half a milliradian. In order to show how bright the laser is, what I'm gonna do, you can see next to this, just as an aside, what happens when you take the attenuator away before you take away the grids to measure the diameter of the beam. It's hot. I'm going to take it away now, and there's a mirror that I set up beforehand that aims the beam outside of this building. And you get an idea of just how powerful this laser is. The beam is now reflecting off that primary mirror, back across the room about 11 meters away, and then it's being sent to a tree and a beam dump about 
20 meters behind the building. Very bright lemon yellow. I'm not sure if it shows up very well in the camera. Sometimes these uh, video cameras will uh, have a trouble in the dark conditions. But you can see even the uh, trees around the beam dump are illuminated. And of course, this is at 50% power. Pretty impressive. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and turn the lights back on here. Turn off the cue switch, which will turn off the laser. Or at least turn off the die. Turn the lights back on. This module, which has been completed, isn't quite as over the top as the uh, die laser, but it does have some neat features. To begin with, uh, it's water-cooled. As you can see, there's a water-cooling circuit that cools both the laser base plate as well as the driver base plate here. And you can also see that there's an unusual setup with the knife edge mirrors. These are M-series diodes collimated by the Rochester 4mm aspheric lenses. You can see that they're impinging on a mirror or a cell here, which on the other side of the laser, because it's inverted, you can see what the, the uh, diode is doing. It's hitting a primary mirror right in its center, which then very accurately positions the laser spot on the prisms on the opposite side. This allows me to maximize the compression of the laser beam and minimize any kind of vignetting or shadowing before the two beams converge in the cube and are then launched by a beam, a mirror behind here up to the upper deck where the beam shaping optics will allow this to be mixed with the yellow beam. Um, final interesting thing about this alignment is that rather than the typical stacking of beams, which is normally done where you put several vertical stripes next to each other in order to fit the square aspect of the scanner. What I've done is I've actually taken the beams and I've arranged them longitudinally so that they're end to end. As a result, I end up with a horizontal stripe about 15 millimeters wide and about a millimeter and a quarter high. What this does is it allows the beam shaping optics on the upper table to compress the beam in the direction in which it has the least divergence and to expand the beam in the direction in which it has the most divergence. As a result, I still get a nice square 4x4 four four millimeter beam for the scanner, but what it also allows me to do is get a nice round spot in the distance with about 3 quarters of a milliradian of divergence. The final component, which is the red laser, I've left for a later date. I've heard some interesting rumors that there may be some fairly exciting options that are coming on uh, the near horizon for red. And so as a result, what I'm going to spend my time on is the beam shaping optics, the dichroic, uh, the scanners to allow these two lasers to operate. And then at that point, when I'm finished with that, I'll incorporate the red that's available when I'm ready to look into that. So that's pretty much it for the video. Uh, Hope you enjoyed it, and thanks very much for watching.